from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Hi, I'm Sandy Simpson from Apologetics Coordination Team. I wrote a booklet uh, quite a long time ago called What Should I Say? Learn how to answer people who invite you uh, to revival meetings where there are different teachings. Learn to discern. I wrote this uh, booklet in order to help people to answer questions or statements that people make and how to answer from the Bible. So how do you answer an invitation to attend a meeting where you know nothing about the speaker or what will be done there? What happens if they want to announce the meeting at your church and invite everyone? What do you say to a person who tells you uh, you don't have the Holy Spirit even though you're a Christian? What should you do if you think something's wrong or your conscience is bothering you about something that was said or done? The answer? Well, it's always the answer. Go to the scriptures. The Bible has all the answers to your questions. And this booklet that I wrote that's now on DVD is an attempt to deal with a few of the typical statements you'll hear from people who have become involved in the third wave revival movement. Now, by the third wave, I'm referring to teachers, prophets, quote-unquote, and any meeting associated with uh, movements such as the Toronto Blessing, Brownsville Assemblies of God, Rodney Howard Brown, Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, Rod Parsley, uh, Marilyn Hickey, Joyce Myers, Bethel Church, Lakeland, and many others who appear on the Trinity Broadcasting Network and 700 Club on TV. Hopefully the statements and answers I give you in this DVD will set you off on an investigation of your own in the Word. Please read the Bible references. I'm not going to read them all, but you need to look them up because they're very important. Yeah, now, if you need help and you have access to the Internet, you can visit my site uh, called Apologetics Coordination Team that deals with these issues and has the articles mentioned in this booklet. The website is located at www.deceptioninthechurch.com. Paul praised the Bereans because they were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. And you know what? We need to do the same thing in our day. So, Please look up the scripture references I had. I'm not going to read them on camera, but they are written down uh, on the screen for you to look up. Um, and these things are key to the answers that I'm giving you uh, in typical statements made from third, the third wave and the answers given. So let's start going through some of these. Statement. You need to come to a meeting where this man can lay hands on you and give you the Holy Spirit anointing. You may be born again, but you may not have the Holy Spirit. Answer, I am a born again Christian, therefore, therefore I'm already sealed and baptized by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit's working within me, convicting, empowering, sanctifying, bestowing grace gifts and producing fruit. The Holy Spirit of God is sovereign, and He cannot be transferred by human hands, by the will of men, which was the misconception of Simon the sorcerer, where he thought it was magic he could buy. A few times in Acts, the Spirit was given at the laying on of hands, 
which was always done in submission to the will of God and in agreement with His purposes. The Holy Spirit in this age immediately indwells all who believe, which does not necessitate the laying on of hands. And an article to read is, What is the Baptism of the Holy Spirit? How does a person receive it? By Dr. John Bechtel, 1996. Statement. We are seeing a great revival in these last days where millions will be saved in preparation for the return of Christ. Answer. The Bible does not indicate a great end times revival or awakening, but rather a great deception, delusion, and the love of people growing cold. The end times are marked by many false prophets and teachers, false Christs, a different spirit, and false doctrines. Um, Matthew 24, 14 says that the gospel will, will be preached to the ends of the earth, but it does not say millions will be saved. Rather, we see from the Bible that those who believe are a little flock, who have little strength, a few who find the small gate and the narrow road. You know, Jesus also asked this, When I come, will I find faith on the earth? A good article to read is Revival or Apostasy by Dave Hunt, 1997. Statement, Come with us to an exciting event where God is doing a new thing and where there is new revelation, not necessarily mentioned in God's word. Answer, God may do a new thing, but it will always be consistent with his unchangeable character his testimony, and his unchanging, unbreakable word. We are commanded not to take, <clears throat> to add or take away from Scripture or to go beyond what's written. We should daily search the Scriptures to discern truth from error. New revelation that does not meet the above criteria must not be accepted. We do not need to be afraid of false prophets who make up new exciting things and prophesy falsely in the name of God, for these prophets and those who follow them will perish. An article to read is The New Thing by Tricia Tillon, 1997. Statement. Don't be afraid of slain in the spirit because a Christian cannot be demonized or deceived. Answer. Though a true believer cannot be possessed by a demon, there's ample evidence from the Bible that believers can be demonized. And here are many, many scriptures for you to look up to see that fact. Christians can also be deceived. What? That's correct. That's what the, that's what the Lord said. They can also give the devil a foothold, shipwreck their faith, and even fall away. That's what Jesus Christ said himself. An article to read, Slain in the Spirit, by Rev. Jacob Prash, 1997. Statement. If you don't come to the revival meeting, you might miss a blessing from God. Answer. Christians are already experiencing blessings from God because of the gospel of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. We also do not believe that revival comes before repentance. Repentance always comes before revival. Repentance only comes as a result of the gospel message being clearly preached which is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. The only way we can miss a blessing from God is to fail to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints, and to turn back and no longer follow Jesus, being carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. good article to read is Prepared for the Slaughter, the Disarming of the Church by John Green, 1998. Statement, it's easier for a person to receive the anointing if they stop analyzing so much and empty their minds. God offends the mind to reveal the heart. Answer, Christians are never to empty their minds. Our minds allow, allow us to know God's will, show God we love Him, and keep in perfect peace. We need to fill our minds with the Word of Christ. Emptying your mind is an occult technique used by Hindus and other false religions. God created our minds, which are always to be submitted to His will. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that God offends the mind to reveal the heart. 
However, if we are offended by the offense of the cross, we'd better check to see if we're saved. We are to be offended, actually. Article to read, A Different Gospel by Myself, 1997. Statement, Come and sit under the teaching of the Latter-day Apostles and Prophets, who are even greater than the Apostles and Prophets of Scripture. Answer, the Bible says that the church is built on the cornerstone, which is Christ, and the foundation of the apostles and prophets. The spiritual building of the church is in its last phase. We must not and cannot lay another foundation for a house that Christ has already built on the cornerstone and foundation of the apostles and prophets. Another question to ask is, are these people they're talking about being persecuted and put to death for the cause of Christ? Or are they making a name for themselves and becoming rich? You know, it's likely you'll find that they are talkers and deceivers, quote-unquote, who are ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. Article to read is A Second Pentecost by Oral Steinkamp, 1999. Statement. God used the force of faith to speak the universe into existence. So we can also use the force of faith to speak health, wealth, and anything else into being. Never pray thy will be done because it shows you have a lack of faith. Answer, uh, maybe you've been watching too much Star Wars. You've also been listening to heretical teachers like Kenneth Copeland and Benny Hinn. God did not use any force of faith to create the world. He did so by his word, his power, and by his will. We do not command God, but we must ask, seek, and knock. You know, he, he asks us to do that. However, we need to ask according to his will as long as his words remain in us. We do not believe in ordering God to do our bidding like Balaam attempted to do on behalf of Balak. That's witchcraft which God forbids. We always pray, Thy will be done, just as Jesus, John, David, Peter, Paul, James, and the Holy Spirit did. Now, a good article to read is Faith in Faith or Faith in God by CRI in 1990. Statement. Listen to all the positive testimonies. They are a good indication that God is doing a work of revival in these meetings. Answer. You know, testimonies can be subjective. That is, they are not easily proven. You know, what really happened? Was the person really healed and for how long? Positive testimonies of life-changing experiences and miracles can be found, by the way, in every religion and cult in the world. Testimonies are nice, but we must not base our faith on them. The first way we are to judge a person or movement is by their doctrinal teachings. If they're teaching false doctrine, you can be sure that it's not a revival from God. Now here are some discernment questions to ask. Are the revival leaders workers of righteousness or workers of iniquity? Are they characterized by financial greed or good works? Good doctrine or fables? Deep Christian character or selfish ambition? Are they lawful or lawless? What are the long-term fruits in terms of Christian character, especially faithfulness, truth, love, mercy, and righteousness? Does the revival as a whole display a love of sound doctrine? What are the revival leaders' attitudes about the scripture? Does the revival have a clear aim? Is it taking people somewhere? Can the results of the movement be built on by later generations? Is it a house of straw or a well-constructed foundation for the future? Is it built on Christ, i.e. the historical Jesus of Scripture? Are the revival leaders sound morally? Does the revival manage to avoid the twin dangers of immorality on one hand and overbearing legalism on the other? What is the attitude of the revival to the rest of the body of Christ? Is it humble or proud? Is it boastful? Does it separate itself? Good article to read on this, How to Evaluate a Spiritual Movement by John Edmiston, 
1997. Statement. Did you know that since you belong to Christ, you are a little God or a little Messiah? You are everything that God is. You are I am. Answer. We believers are all children of God, sons of God, and together the bride of Christ. We are not, however, Christ himself, nor are we God. If we're little gods, then the statement that there's only one God would be untrue. There's also only one Father's Son, who is Jesus Christ. This little God's teaching by people like Kenneth Copeland and Benny Hinn is a doctrine of demons, because it's one of the first lies that Satan told Eve, and the sin of Satan himself. Also, the body of Christ is not Christ himself. Christ is the head of his church. Jesus is 100% man and 100% God for all eternity, and physically in his glorified body sits at the right hand of God. He's coming again bodily to rule and judge the earth. Good article to read, Unbiblical Doctrines, Teachings, and Phenomena of the Third Wave Counterfeit Revival by myself, 1997. Statement. Those who question the teachings of the leaders of the revival may end up cursed. Answer. It is true they may end up cursed, but not by God. Many revival leaders have caused any person to uh, have cursed any person to death that disagrees with what they're doing and teaching. Benny Hinn has done this many times, as well as John Kilpatrick, Steve Hill, and Mike Brown of Brownsville, and Paul Crouch of Trinity Broadcasting Network, who's now deceased. God commands us to discern truth from error, test the spirits, check what's taught with the scriptures, and reject heretics. We're also commanded of God not to curse like these men curse and persecute us, but to bless. An article to read is Accusers of the Brethren or Good Bereans by Deborah Bowie, 1997. Statement. The Bible says, Judge not, lest you be judged. Don't judge this move of God or its leaders. Touch not the Lord's anointed. Answer. The kind of judging in Matthew 7.1 is talking about hypocritical judgment. In other words, judging someone for what they are doing while you're doing the same thing. However, there are many ways in which we are called to judge. We are to judge what people teach, judge between right and wrong morally, test the spirits. If a person or movement is teaching false doctrine or making false prophecies, we are to rebuke them. If they do not repent, we are to come away from them, mark them and avoid them, have no fellowship with them, withdraw from them, turn away from them, separate ourselves from them, and not even receive them into our homes. By the way, that includes the TV. As to the touch not the Lord's anointed argument, David did not touch, or in other words, kill Saul, but he did rebuke him in front of his entire army on two occasions. Though we do not kill false prophets as they did in the Old Testament, we are called to test them, rebuke them, and avoid them if they do not repent. Good article to read, Judge Not, by Rev. Jacob Prash, 1998. Statement. Gamaliel advised, Let them alone, for if this work be of men, it will come to naught, but if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it. Just wait and see how this revival turns out in the end. Don't stand against it. Answer. Gamaliel was a highly respected Pharisee and teacher of the day, but you know he was no friend of Christians. While his advice saved the apostles, Gamaliel had actually given some bad advice to his fellow council members. Were people to follow this advice, one could never speak out against error. One could never stand up and say about a group claiming Jesus Christ as their leader, for instance, that uh, Mormonism is wrong. They claim Jesus Christ, but he's a different Jesus. We're called as Christians to discern error and to mark and avoid those who are divisive and heretical. Good article to read on this subject, Gambling on Gamaliel by uh, Bob Hunter, 1997. Statement. 
A great end-time revival is preparing the earth to be subdued by the anointed. All authority will be given to the man-child, and then Christ can return to his, in his church. Answer. As stated previously, the Bible does not indicate a great end times revival or awakening, but rather a great deception, delusion, and the love of people growing cold. Our place as Christians is not to subdue the earth, as Christ will do that when He returns. Our job is to preach the gospel and take care of the less fortunate, keeping ourselves from being polluted by the world. All authority is given to Christ. Any authority we have is based on obedience to the will of the Father. We will not have authority over the nations during the millennial reign of Christ unless we overcome by faith and do God's will to the end. Great article to read, Kingdom Theology by Albert James Dagger, 1992. Statement. It's better to have the devil manifesting in a meeting than for nothing to be happening. Oh, really? Answer. Rodney Howard Brown said, I'd rather be in a church where the devil and the flesh are manifesting than in a church where nothing is happening because people are too afraid to manifest anything. And if the devil manifests, don't worry about that either. Rejoice, because at least something is happening. What an awful thing to say. It does look like the devil has been manifesting in many third wave meetings because the following have been ob observed. Uncontrollable laughing, crying, shaking, running around the church building, fast dancing, running followed by collapse, barking, howling, trances, drunkenness, falling out, oinking, being hot, uh, fanning self or blowing, um, walking like chickens, uh, horse noises, mooing and crowing, swimming, women going through imaginary birth pangs. Um, loss of consciousness, trying to soar like eagles, hissing and moving like a snake, inability to speak, involuntary body spasms, kung fu-like stances, uh, vomiting, head banging, and stripping off of clothes. You know what? God is not a God of disorder, and we must conduct ourselves in an orderly way in the church. These are not manifestations of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit builds people up to be more like Christ, not lowering them to animal behavior. These manifestations are, are more like demonization as described in the scripture. An article to read, Answering Counterfeit Revival Leader, Reverend John Kilpatrick, by myself, 1997. Statement. Well, there are unusual things going on at the revival meeting. God can do anything he wants to do. Don't put God in a box. Answer. Is it possible for any person to put God in a box? What a ridiculous statement. God is sovereign, almighty, omnipresent, omniscient. However, if you think about it, God did limit the way he evidences himself and the way he works in his creation. For instance, God could have uh, made people purple with green hair. He could have made reincarnation true, but he didn't. What he did do was put his word and testimony in scriptures, which, are, which we are not to go beyond, by the way. He set, set down his will and his law in the Old Testament and the law of Christ in the New Testament, which is grace and love. God's character is consistent and faithful, and he does not change. If something unbiblical is happening in a meeting or to an individual, it's not from God. Uh, article to read, Weighed and Found Wanting by Reverend Bill Randall's 1995. By the way, that's also a book you can get. Statement, I have been praying for the power to come upon me for a long time, and it's here. I can feel it. It has changed my life for the better. Answer, there's no place in the Bible where we're told to pray for power. Therefore, this is a very dangerous prayer. We also should not summon the Holy Spirit to meetings because He's already present where two or three are gathered together. Summoning or invoking is basically sorcery. The scriptures do, not, do show us how to pray, though, and here are some examples from scripture. Pray for the people of your nation. Pray for your city. 
Pray for peace in Jerusalem. Pray for your persecutors. Pray for children. Pray for escape from, a, from judgment. Pray you will not fall into temptation. Pray for Christians. Pray for boldness in proclaiming the gospel and for God to do miracles in people's lives. Pray all the time. Be alert. Pray for the saints. Pray for fearless preaching. Pray to be filled with the knowledge of His will. Pray for open doors for the gospel. Pray that the word of God may be glorified. Pray for deliverance from evil men. Pray for everyone, kings, authorities, peace, quiet, godliness, holiness. Pray for life for dead sinners. You know, there are other things we are taught to pray for in Scripture, but the point is we need to follow the scriptural model of prayer. There are only two places actually where the words pray prayer and power are mentioned. Let's go into these briefly. Quote, With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may count you worthy of His calling and that by His power He may fulfill every good uh, purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. 2 Thessalonians 1.11 Paul was not praying for them to get the power, but that God by His power would fulfill every good purpose of theirs and every act prompted by their faith. This is by the sovereign will of God, which is, uh, you know, which if followed will produce good works. If God's will is not, fo not followed, it can only produce fleshly or even demonic fruit. The second reference I want to uh, read is this, quote, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Ephesians 3, 16-19 here again, Paul is praying for the Ephesians, not for himself. He prays that the indwelling Holy Spirit will show them how, Christ, how much Christ loves them, so they may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. This speaks of the empowerment to have love and faith and to understand Christ in a deeper way, not power to perform miracles or, or for some ecstatic experience. So you know what? There's no prayer for power to be found in the Bible. Christians need to pray according to the will of God and leave empowerment up to the Holy Spirit in His time and according to His will. An article to read is Healing in the Kingdom by Dr. Paul Hebert, 1989. He was a professor at Fuller Seminar, Seminary with John Wimber and C. Peter Wagner at the time when the course was being taught by John Wimber on Signs and Wonders. Statement. Why don't you come and be healed at the revival meeting? God guarantees healing for everyone who has enough faith. Answer, first of all, there are all kinds of healing. When God heals, he does true, creative, divine miracles that last. There are also healings, quote-unquote, that are just people, for instance, getting excited and thinking they're healed. But when the excitement wears off, they're just as bad or worse off than they were before. Remember, the enemy can also heal, as well as cause sickness. Healings and miracles by the devil are temporary and do not last very long, or are false, lying miracles. Those who allow people who are not living in obedience to God's will to lay hands on them for healing, give the enemy a foothold in their lives, and he will not let go of it without repentance and deliverance. Be very careful of those who claim they can heal you. You better know a whole lot about them before you allow them to lay hands on you. Secondly, God does not guarantee healing for everyone who believes. Sometimes He allows sickness and difficulties in our lives to teach us lessons, such as our weakness and His strength, our dependence on His grace, our need for an overcoming faith. You know, it's true that we are told to pray for the sick in faith and the Lord will heal them. And forgive. But sometimes we must also suffer sickness and persecutions. 
Trials are used by God to develop perseverance and faith, and they're also a testimony th to those around us if we go through them uh, in a good way, trusting the Lord. An article to read, Sick Healers, by Reverend uh, Robert Lee Chow, 1998. Statement. You should come to the meetings because there's a prophet there who will prophesy over you if you ask him or her. He has been wrong a couple of times, but then prophets today do not have to be 100% correct, only about 60%, as Prophet Bob Jones prophesied. Answer, the Bible's quite clear on this. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods must be put to death. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is, that, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. You know, this precept is not canceled out in the New Testament. Bob Jones is a false prophet who conveniently ignores the word of God so he can continue to falsely prophesy. The scriptural precept of 100% accuracy for a prophet is for our own protection. Many Christians mistake uh, you know, human intuition and even demonic voices, whether actually correct or incorrect, for the still small voice of the Spirit. You know, it's a dangerous thing to promote what you're saying as a direct word from God. Once you say, thus saith the Lord, and what you've prophesied does not come true, <laughs> you've made yourself a lying false prophet, and church discipline must be applied. Once you say, thus saith the Lord, and what you've prophesied does not come true, then you're, you've made yourself a false prophet, and church discipline must be applied. Only God can truly forgive false prophecy when a person chooses to speak directly for him. The church should ignore false prophets. People who continue to sit under their teaching are opening themselves up to deception. Article to read, False Prophets by Dr. Kenneth Johnson, 1994. Statement. The speaker last night had a wonderful vision where Elijah appeared to him and told him what would happen in our, in our island. Listen to what he said. Answer. If a dead person is allegedly appearing and giving messages, that's expressly forbidden in Scripture for believers. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. Talking to dead people? is necromancy or being a medium. Talking to the dead is actually talking to demons. Benny Hinn has done this on numerous occasions, seeing dead people like Catherine Kuhlman and Amy Semple McPherson. He even visits their graves to get more of the anointing. Stay far away from people who are into necromancy, whether they claim to be a believer or not. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep, and that mutter, mutter uh, should not a people seek unto their God, for the living to the dead? To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Article to, article to read, Benny Hinn and Necromancy, Talking to the Dead, by Joseph Chambers, 1997. Statement. The teachers at the revival meetings teach some things that are a little different from the Bible, well, what the Bible says, but they're so powerful and sure of themselves. It must be of God. Answer. If teachers do not hold to the basic doctrines of the church, they're not true believers. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. There are many doctrines, but here are five that are at the core of Christianity. Number one, the Trinity. God must be one what and three who's, which e with each who possessing all the attributes of deity and personality. Number two, the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is 100% God and 100% man for all eternity. Number three, the second coming. Jesus Christ is coming bodily to earth.
to rule and judge. Number four, salvation. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Number five, the scripture. It is entirely inerrant and sufficient for all Christian life. You know, you need to study what they teach carefully. They may state that they agree with the above doctrines, but by what they teach and do, a false teacher will deny one or all of these core doctrines. The third wave teachers have proven over time that they do not hold to these doctrines by teaching heresy that undermines them. For instance, when they treat the spirit as a substance, an it, both deity and personality is denied, thus denying the triune nature of God. Or when they preach a gospel of repent and come to Jesus without mentioning the cross or resurrection, salvation by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone is denied. Be on the alert and study to show yourself approved, rightly handling the word of truth. And an article to read is my article called The Five Basic Doctrines that I wrote in 1999. So in conclusion, stand firm in your faith. Always be discerning by checking everything with the Word of God. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter, 2 Thessalonians 2.15. Stand up for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. Don't, let, don't ever let anyone cause you to stop doing that. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Jude 1, 3 through 4. Be aware that many false teachers have gone out today. Test their teachings in the word because they're deadly dangerous. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They were secretly introduced destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. 2 Peter 2.1 Finally, correct, rebuke, and encourage because many are turning from true faith in Christ to heresy. Endure hardship from those who persecute you and tell you you need to get involved in some new thing. Preach the gospel and live in obedience to the word and will of God. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an, of, of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministries. That's very important. Very important verse for us to follow today.